Hello, everybody, and welcome to Heart of the Matter. I'm your host, Elizabeth Vargas. Great to have you with us. And today we have a treat for those of you who might be football fans. I don't know about you, but I've been kind of missing my weekend football games now that the season has come to a close with a super exciting Super Bowl. Today's guest is Darren Waller. He's an NFL tight end for the Las Vegas Raiders and is definitely one of the most exciting players to watch on the field right now. He played in the Pro Bowl in 2020 and 21 and is really at the top of his game. But Darren Waller has had a rocky road getting there. He was suspended twice from the NFL for violating drug policy. He overdosed in 2015 in a Jeep in a parking lot, if you can believe it, all by himself and somehow survived. After that, he went to rehab. He got sober. He got a job at a grocery store stacking produce for $11 an hour and eventually worked his way back into the NFL. He's doing incredibly well. He has started a foundation to help kids like himself, kids who in their teens sometimes turn to drugs and alcohol to avoid feeling anxious, depressed, like they don't fit in, sometimes to reduce trauma. At any rate, Darren Waller is paying it forward in a major way. And boy, is he at the top of his game. It's a real amazing story of redemption and strength and courage And we talk about everything, not just his journey through recovery and substance use disorder, but also his thoughts on the NFL and race. As one of the many Black players in the NFL, he's a lot of thoughts about Coach Brian Flores' lawsuit against the NFL, accusing them of racial discrimination. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Darren Waller. Darren Waller, welcome to Heart of the Matter. It's great to have you here. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh my gosh. I'm a huge football fan. Like It feels like the rest of the country is. So having you on, one of the few NFL players in recovery who's really been public about it and still having an amazing, like incredible career and really paying it forward. I'm really, really excited to have you on. First of all, I was interested when I was reading the background of your story that you started using substances when you were just 15 years old, uh, still in high school, because you said you were anxious and isolated. And But I was very struck by this. You didn't feel black enough. You didn't feel white enough. And you didn't feel cool enough. And as I look at you right now, I'm like, you've got to be kidding. But tell me about that. Yeah. I mean, I grew up in Ackworth, Georgia. It's a suburb of Atlanta. Mm. We moved there and the first friends I made in my neighborhood were white, but I mean, it was really just because they were doing the same things that I like to do outside. So I was just hanging out with them and that's who I just roll with most of the time. And uh, people that look like me just, I mean, they, we were so trained like in this passed down through generations to like, you know, have a disdain for each other in some way, you know, and it's just like, it's just weird. Like, why are you hanging around them? It's just so everything that I was doing was so different. I was just into different things. I, I talked different than most black kids, black people. You know, I talked too proper, I dressed different. So it's just like, you know, I felt I automatically assumed that I was doing something wrong when really the whole, the whole time it was like me being different was what was unique about me and what was going to be, you know, set me apart from people. But I couldn't see it that way as a five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten year old and then through high school. Right. It was just like I want to fit in, do what everybody else is doing. And I couldn't find a way to fit in to save my life. Yeah, that's a very common thing for kids. They just want to be like everybody else. Um, you know, it doesn't it doesn't they're not saying, hey, I'm unique and I'm special and I'm, you know, different this way. They just want to be like everybody else. So how right. did that feeling like you never fit in, how did that lead you to pick up a substance at the really young age of 15 years old? Just because there w- wasn't really much working out. I mean, I was always like, I'm never going to do drugs or alcohol, you know? But then it was like, you know, the way it was presented, it was presented in a way that it was like, it'll make me feel good. And I was like, well, I would like, I would like to feel good. I don't think I feel good most of the time. So, and it was also a way for me to be accepted by 
you know, people that were considered cooler than I was. So, you know, and then the feeling that it gave me once I did it, uh, all those things together uh, was the beginning of my journey. What was it that you took? Uh, it was like uh, opiates, like hydrocodone, oxycodones was the beginning. And then mm-hmm. more of those pills and then like higher, uh, you know, dosages of those. How did you get prescription pain pills as a kid? How did you get those? My friends had them in their parents' medicine cabinets. And then, ah. you know, for me, I was, I mean, I was smart as a kid and very aware and uh, very good at manipulating things. So I could like see somebody with a cast on and I could like go up to them and talk to them without anybody seeing me and being like, I'll pay you for these. You could put them in your mailbox or we could figure something out. Like anytime I would go to somebody's house, I would raid their medicine cabinet. Like I'll say, like, oh, I'm about to go to the bathroom. And I'd go in the medicine cabinet. And if you had something, cough syrup, pills, anything like I'm, I'm snatching it. <laughs> but you didn't drink or, or, or did you? I started drinking like uh, uh, probably the end of my junior year. Okay. I started smoking weed and I started drinking too. Okay. And in high school, you uh, joined the football team. As you said, you you grew up in Georgia. Football is king in the South. Right. Um, and you said that you joined the football team as a as a way to be cool and fit in. I mean, yeah, I, I actually loved football since I was like four years old, but it eventually became like a people-pleasing tool just because... I could see like, oh, well, they'll, if I'm good at football, they'll, they'll always accept me. So I kind of was just like, use it as that. And the joy of the game kind of evaporated as I made it what it was. And, you know, by the end of being in high school, I was just, you know, I didn't really enjoy it that much because it just, when you play the game of pleasing people, you could never win. Like there's Mm -hmm. no end. There's always going to be more people to impress. I mean, there's 7 billion people in the world. So. But yeah, it just became kind of eh, by the time I went off to college. You went to college, Georgia Tech? Yep, Georgia Tech. Yeah, full scholarship? Yes. Yeah, you were obviously super good even then. Um, did you develop a love for the sport even playing for Georgia Tech? No, I hated it more and more as I went through college. And then even like my first few years in the league up until I got suspended for the year, like I just there wasn't much joy in it. It was just more anxiety and like fear of failure and failure and getting in trouble. So how did you, uh, you know, we've had a couple other professional athletes on the podcast who have dealt with addiction um, and were able to take substances and compete at an incredibly high level. How, how did you do that? I mean, you, Went from high school to a huge D1 college that, you know, on a full scholarship and then get drafted into the NFL to the Baltimore Ravens. I mean, how did you perform at such a high level while you were doing these drugs? I mean, I feel like it's mostly God given ability. And then like when I was like there, like in the building, like I would practice with pretty good effort. I would know the plays. I would know like what to do you know, and could make things happen off of that. But I mean, but it was like on the back end when it came to things to do outside the building, like taking care of my body and, you know, doing extra film study and stuff like that. Like I never really did any of that. So that's why I was like, I could do good at times. I could do some, have some great flashes, but as far as like overall consistency, I just wasn't investing enough just because I was investing in my addiction. You once said that you would get up early in the morning and use, and then you would go to practice, and then you would come home and use more. Is that really how it happened? Yeah, I mean, any gap in the day that I had, I would take advantage of to go back to my dorm or go meet somebody where they were at or figure out, you know, whatever the easiest way for me to do that and still be where I had to be on time. That was my focus. Did any of your teammates or your coaches notice this? Did anybody say, hey, this isn't good? Uh, I mean, my teammates, the teammates I was rolling with were doing the same things I was doing. So it wasn't really a problem to them. Holy cow. I mean, kind of like I said, as far as like manipulating, like I was, I'm a master at going somewhere and making it seem like everything's great. And like that, um, I can be respectful and have a smile on my face and tell a crack a joke and you know, things like that. So it was like nobody could ever 
pick up or, you know, have a scent of, you know, what I was doing. Like, I'm sure it probably smelled like alcohol some of the most a good bit of the time. But I mean, they weren't seeing that as a problem because a lot of other dudes were doing the same thing. Is there uh, enough monitoring in the NFL of players who might be abusing drugs or alcohol, do you think? Um, I mean, they have a drug program, but I mean, if you're not in the drug program, you only have to pass one drug test a year. And it's in like the a window between April and August. If you pass that test, there's no other tests for you to take. So you can really just do whatever you want. So, I mean, it's really not, you know, nobody's really monitoring anybody on a day-to-day basis. It's really just like when you get in trouble, then they punish you or then, then they offer something, but it's like, mm-hmm. there's no, there's no monitoring. What about your mom and dad? Could they see that you were in trouble or were you able to hide that from them too? Um, I mean, they knew that I was like smoking and drinking and stuff, but they didn't know the frequency at which I was using and mixing all other types of stuff. Yeah. And, you know, and doing it to, as far as like to escape and everything. Cause I mean, as far as everybody else was concerned on paper, I had a great life and everything looked like I should be enjoying it and loving it, but it wasn't the case. A lot of people, I mean, I felt the same way when I was in the grip of my addiction to alcohol. A lot of people, I don't know about you, but I've never felt so lonely in my whole life than during that time period. Uh, mostly because you, you're putting up this complete front. Like I'm pretending to be fine when I don't feel fine. Right. And I'm pretending I'm not drinking when in fact I'm secretly drinking. And I'm pretending I'm confident when I'm as anxious as hell. I mean, how did, did you, I see you nodding. Do you feel the same way? Yeah, that's exactly it. I mean, from all the frat parties and bars and all this other stuff that we used to go do, and there'd always be a ton of people around, but I never felt connected to any of them. And it's just like, even with all my like guys in college that I roll with and stuff, like as far as like a day to day basis and really considering somebody a friend, like I don't keep up with any of them because it was just that was that was our connection. Was so it's like mm. even in that it was just like I mean. They were just help me escape my reality for a little bit. Yeah. I'm always struck by the fact that, you know, as you said, anybody from the outside looking in thinks, my God, what a blessed, amazing life you're having. And yet you at the center of it all are thinking, I'm really miserable and I want to numb myself. You know, it just goes to show you just can't always tell what somebody might be feeling. You never know. So you... Ended up getting suspended for four games in 2016 because you tested positive for drugs. I was suspended twice in the league. I got suspended twice in college. Yeah. And still nobody came to you and said, hey, you you need help? You want to go someplace and get help even after the suspensions? Oh, yeah. People were doing that. They sent me to a couple of outpatient programs in college. And like I said, master manipulator. I could tell anybody what they wanted to hear and be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But just go do exactly what I wanted to do. I mean, same thing in the league. Nobody was going to tell me that I wasn't going to use. Like, I came into the league in the drug program, and people knew I was in the drug program. So I was like, I'm not hanging out with none of y'all. So I was just by myself. And I had one teammate that I would hang out with. And that was it in Baltimore. So, yeah, people were trying to tell me, like, oh, hey, like, what are we doing? Like, come on, and, like, snap out of it. Like, you know, people don't really, that don't really have any kind of idea about what addiction it is. I'd be like, snap out of it. Or, like, my coach in Baltimore was like, you're not mentally tough. And I'm just like, all right, like, screw you then. There's no reason for me to associate with you anymore if it's just kind of like a put down thing. So it's like, it was a wide range of things. Like most people were trying to support me. A lot of people that were like, maybe a little bit ignorant to how addiction works, but they were, I mean, they were really trying to help and try to see me be the best version of myself. But I mean, when you're in that, you just see everybody as a threat. Yeah. Pro tip, snap out of it isn't what isn't what works when somebody's struggling with substance use disorder. Right. Everything changed for you on August 11th, 2017, when you overdosed in your own Jeep. Right. Tell me about that day. What happened? Yeah, I was in Baltimore. I was supposed to be moving. I was going to be moving out of my apartment because I was two months in my suspension. I was going to be moving back to my parents' house. And I was like, I'm just going to get high one more time while I'm here before I go back home. And People have been telling me that in Baltimore that people have been pressing pills, like and putting like something on to make them seem like they're the pill that you usually get, but it's something different. So it was like fentanyl, and I was just in the parking lot. And I was going to get out and go get some food and uh, some beer, I think, but I couldn't get out of the car. I knew I was going to like fall out or like throw up everywhere, 
And so I just stayed in the car and just had the car off. And then I just like passed out in the car. And then like, it was kind of like, I just like laid my head to the side and just woke up and it was nighttime. And I was like, you know, covered in like the biggest beads of sweat, you know, I've ever seen. And I was just like, felt like it was just a crazy, crazy experience ever. And I just lucky to be alive and went home. And now it's just like, I knew then I was like, yeah, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing these pills anymore. Like that was enough for me to be like, I'm not doing pills anymore. I wasn't sold on like not drinking yet because it's, you know, people, so it's socially acceptable or whatever. But Mm -hmm. at that time I was like, yeah, I'm definitely not doing pills anymore. And I stopped smoking weed before that experience because weed was just making me, I was already paranoid at that time, but weed was making me extremely paranoid. So I stopped smoking weed. So yeah, that was enough for me to put the pills down. Do you know how lucky you are? Do you? I mean, we know that the overdose rates for opioids and even cocaine are way up because so many of these drugs today are now being laced with fentanyl. Right. Fentanyl kills kids, kills people who take a drug and think it's what they normally get, but fentanyl has been mixed into it. And you had that happen to you and managed to survive it. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, I'm definitely lucky. That's all I can see. God and everything like you know, especially like going through like a 12 step program. Mm-hmm. I knew, God, I knew God was like real. So it wasn't like finding my higher, but it was just like, kind of like returning, you know? Yeah. And realizing that it's like everything from then until like now just makes too much sense. And it's like all perfectly orchestrated. So it was easier for me to see as far as like spiritually. So you went to rehab a month later. Was that the first time you went to rehab? Yeah, it was my first time going to a rehab and like being there full time. 28 days, yeah, inpatient rehab. And you said literally you're, it, it, you had like a track change. Your life completely changed course. Yeah. Partly it was the overdose scared you. <laughs> it scared you badly, obviously. You, you could have died and you knew that. But what made you put everything else down? Was it the stint in rehab? Was it coming so close to, you know, dying after overdosing, you know, all by yourself in a car where nobody could have called 911 and helped you if, if you had needed it. What was it that made you, because I asked because there are a lot of people who go to rehab and still can't get it. So why did it work for you on your first try? Um, I would just say that in that time of being scared, like I was, finally willing to be like as vulnerable as possible um, or just as honest as possible. So, and then just being able to see how, you know, my using stuff like that were linked to how I was feeling when I was a kid and, you know, things that happened up until that point that, mm-hmm. um, and, you know, just the fact that I wasn't willing to accept life. Like I wasn't willing to be in reality. I had to change everything. I always had to, you know, I needed the instant gratification of the drugs and stuff because I just, you know, I always needed to be in control. So just going there and just putting everything out on the table, being as honest as possible and just feeling how liberating it felt to be honest, even though it was difficult, but just doing that, it taught me that I don't need to run from uncomfortable things. Like I need to go through them because on the other side, it, it, just feels better it feels like you know and i have like more self-respect so i just stuck with it because everything that i tried that was uncomfortable was like that's what i need to be doing so every step of the 12-step program and just continuing to be honest and go to meetings and stuff like that it was just like just felt like it was where i needed to be and what i needed to be doing so i just you know kind of stuck with it and if you just do it one one day at a time, like I said, like it's cliche, but no, it isn't. It really isn't. Look up, and then it's like your life is really different. Like people will start to notice. People were like noticing change in me before I even noticed. Honestly, mm-hmm. tell me about that conversation with your mom and dad when you told them I need to go to rehab. I need to get help. Was that hard? It wasn't really. I mean, I went so I went to see this addiction specialist. The team, the league, you know, suggested that I go. Um, so I went and then he was like, you need to go to rehab like immediately. So I went home and I was just like, I wasn't really sold, you know, cause I was just, like my pride and everything. But told my parents, I was like, they say I need to go to rehab. And then there, my parents were like, it's probably smart, you know? And then they were sharing like my family history as far as 
there's a lot of addiction, a lot of alcoholism on both sides of the family. So uh, yeah. it's more so at that point, it was like, you know, having the power to, you know, be different, start something new, you know, within the, my, my family, like generational curses being broken type of thing. So that was enough for me to, you know, take it a little more seriously because up until that point in my life, I was just, you know, I just felt like I was floating through it. There wasn't any kind of purpose or, or meaning to it, but that right there was just like the first injection of any kind of meaning or purpose. Like, Oh, my family's dying because of this. I could potentially be someone that switches this and essentially preserves life. So, so you get out of rehab, you go to meetings, do you go to meetings every day? Uh, I don't go to meetings every day, but I mean, I'm going to like, two to three a week at least. Mm -hmm. And, but in the months that you get out of rehab before you went back to football, at that point you were working on your recovery. You got a job at a grocery store. Right. And you say actually, and this is what's so surprising because somebody might say, oh my God, look how far he's fallen. He used to be the star player, you know, big star in Georgia Tech, drafted the Baltimore Ravens. He's working at a grocery store. And yet you say you were the happiest you've ever been. Yeah. I mean, I was just because I was doing the work and, you know, in my recovery and at my job, you know, and I just respected myself more. And I was like, you know, breaking out of my line, you know, I was breaking out of the manipulation and just the, the my traits that built up my character over that long period of time. And so I just... And it was like, I don't have to perform for all these people. I can just, you know, be me and just continue to to better myself, you know. And honestly, looking back, I just see that as an experience where, you know, my humility needed to be developed in order for me to handle success well. So I look back on that experience. And then because now it's like a lot of things that, you know, may give people like a big head or make them be like kind of full themselves. like. I don't know. I just don't feel that or because, I mean, I haven't always been on top and things haven't always been great. So I'm not going to act like I'm like, my shit don't stink. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, I do. So at some point you finally go back to the Baltimore Ravens and you're on the practice team because your spot on the regular main team has been taken by somebody else. Essentially, yeah. Yeah. Um, You know, some people might say, I'm too good for this, or I don't want to do this. Or, you know, that's humiliating to go to the practice team. You didn't. Yeah. I mean, I got cut, put on practice squad. And then, I mean, just going through the Sprouts experience. Sprouts is the grocery store you worked in. Yeah. And then working through uh, the 12 steps. I mean, like I'm saying, it, it teaches, you know, service and, you know, and the humility part as well. Like, there's nothing flashy about the practice squad, but I was able to change my perspective on things. Like, didn't always have to be finding what's wrong with something or finding the bad and something. Like, I always have power in my perspective, so I could see it as our defense is the number one defense in the league. What better barometer for me than to practice against them on a daily basis? And if I do well there, then you know I know that. I mean, even if I don't get an opportunity to play again, it's it's not because I wasn't ready. So so you weren't feeling remorse. You weren't feeling like I'm too good for this. You weren't feeling humiliated. You just went there and did your very best. Yeah. And guess what? John Gruden, who was then the coach of the Raiders, noticed you, picked you up and said about you, you are, quote, the best player he's ever coached. You went on to the the Raiders, where you did extraordinarily well. I mean, holy cow, what a career. Can you believe sometimes that you've clawed your way back up to the very pinnacle of the of the NFL? Um, I mean, I still haven't really wrapped my mind around everything, and I don't think I ever will, to be honest. But, um, but I mean, I'm grateful to be here, for sure. Grateful to have an impact on people. Grateful to just be working towards my potential, you know, and then not just being like, you know, potential being like he could be this, but me actually like working towards it and walking in it feels pretty good. How do you approach it differently now? How do you approach football differently? How do you approach life differently now that you're in recovery? It's just not about pleasing people anymore. It's about being as present to the moment as possible and just 
connecting to the joy that's there in anything, not trying to figure out what's wrong, but being intentional with my gratitude, doing my best effort in everything that I do. But yeah, just try to be fully present as possible because a lot of times I'm like having shame or guilt of the past or, you know, I'm trying to think and analyze and arrange things down the road that aren't even here yet. So as present as I can stay to the moment just enhances the quality of my life. I'm able to be who I am in the different things I do. You don't feel any more shame and guilt now over your past, do you? Or is that something that still raises its head sometimes? Uh, no, I don't. You know, it's kind of like um, in the big book, it says something along the lines of uh, we no longer wish to shut the door on our past. And there's like another part where it's like your dark past is the greatest possession that you have. So it's just like, like I see it like that. My story is helping people now. And mm -hmm. it's really what God is using for, you know, me to, you know, leave a legacy in the world, I guess. You recently celebrated four years of sobriety. Actually, it's what, about six months ago? Yeah, it's like four and a half years now. Four and a half years. But the entire team celebrated your four year anniversary. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah, that was pretty dope. I mean, I was just expecting to just, you know, go through the day and, you know, maybe hitting hit a meeting that night. Uh, but they, it was like at the end of the day, so I was like ready to go home. But they had that. Uh, and it was pretty awesome for people to, to recognize that. Um, just reflect on the journey of what it was like before where, you know, I didn't really have any relationships with people in the building like that. But for them to, you know, I guess think that much of me to have that. It's pretty cool. You've also helped a teammate of yours get sober. Tell me about that. Yeah, Max. Um, yeah. No, I was never even with him. Like I was, but he got drafted in 2019, I believe. So I was already, so I was already sober by then. So I was never with him when he was, you know, in his alcoholism and stuff like that. But um, I guess he said that he looked to me uh, and just saw that how my life turned around after I got sober and he was just like, you know, willing to give it a try. And, you know, I was in some of the Zoom meetings where he was first coming to meetings and, you know, getting into the world of recovery. So, you know, just trying to be there for him in that environment. Um, but I mean, he got, you got to put the work in yourself too. Yeah. So he's done that and you see it just in, is just how serious he is on a day to day basis about his craft and, you know, just the sense of urgency that he works with. You, in this past season, by the way, you guys made it to the playoffs. I mean, it was an, pretty incredible. Um, you um, had battled an injury and you were diagnosed with COVID. I'm curious, especially with the injury, I'm sure the first thing the team doctor wants to do is prescribe you painkillers. Did, well, how did you handle that, given your history? Uh, I mean, I always just come up uh, from the jump, like, I'm not doing that. Like, I had a surgery on my thumb at the end of 2019, and I, and I told him, I was like, look, if I got to bite a towel or something, like, whatever, like, I'm not doing pain meds. Like, I'll do, like, Moultrin and, and Tylenol and stuff, but that's pretty much it. And they're kind of like, you sure? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> That's a test, you know, so that you've got doctors staying in front of you saying, dude, you need some painkillers. Um, would have been very easy to say, you're right. I just had surgery. I just had, you know, this big injury. I need to take something. I, it's something I've seen other people in recovery uh, struggle with, even people whose drug or substance of choice wasn't Percocet or oxycodone, you know, people who are just alcoholics. If, you know, some of them steer clear painkillers because it's a slippery slope. Right. But yeah, I mean, just, you know, I'm willing to go through pain to preserve, you know, my recovery and my spiritual progress. Like if I have to be in pain, I'll be in pain. Like it's, I'll be okay. <laughs> you also have started a foundation aimed at helping adolescents who are struggling with substance use disorder. Uh, how did you decide to do that and and how does it work um yeah as far as the foundation i just wanted to you know I, I had been you know sharing my story a few places but i was like i feel like service 
you know, looks bigger than, and just like on a larger scale, um, as far as like, as my platform is growing. So I thought the foundation was a good way, uh, to do that, to help, uh, young people. Just cause I feel like there's a lot of young people that feel like I feel, yeah. you know, if they go the route of drugs and alcohol, they never come out of it. You know, they could be robbing the world of who they really are because, you know, I was close to never even being in this position, you know, so just want to, you know, share my story and my toolkit, I guess, with them. And, you know, it looks like right now, it looks like uh, sending people to treatment. We've been, we've been uh, paying for people's 30 uh, day stays. And now we're uh, incorporating like aftercare and sober living into it. That's amazing. And then maybe from there, like there's no, there are no youth centers for um, kids struggling with substances in Nevada. They always uh, send them to Utah or like a different, state you know so maybe even you know putting a youth center here for uh, kids to you know learn about their disease to have treatment opportunities and just to have other ways of you know coping like me like learning i learned how to meditate and rehab i learned i really started diving deeper into my music and rehab you know things like that so just allowing them to have a safe space how does meditation work for you? How how long do you do it? Do you do it every day? Uh, yeah, I do it every day. Wow, I try. I don't. I don't always succeed. <laughs> when I wake up, I like to do it just in different pockets throughout the day. Whether it's like I can find a two minute pocket, if I can find like little different three minute, five minute pockets to do it throughout the day, that works. You know, it's it's hard. I mean, if we're busy people, it's hard to have multiple 20 minute sessions, you know, like mm-hmm. I do that in the morning and then maybe before bed, but I feel like the ones are just returning throughout the day really helps me stay present and really help keeps me from, you know, worrying about trivial things. So that's what you do to treat the anxiety, so to speak, because once you get sober, I mean, you, life still happens, you know, and there's pain in life and there's discomfort in life. And it can, there's a lot of high emotions, some of it negative in life. And when you're not using substances, I mean, let's get real. I mean, most people, even people who have no issues at all with addiction, use alcohol to relax and, you know, to fit in in social events and that sort of thing. Um, when you don't have that anymore, is, is meditation what helps take the edge off and helps keep you centered? Or is there something else? Do you, I know you also do yoga, for example. Yes. Prayer and meditation are the go-tos for sure. Music for me, reading, writing in a journal, yoga, you know, even just going for a walk. It's a lot of, a lot of things that I have available to me. It's going to meetings. It's a therapist. It's having a sponsor. So, you know, I'm never just left to just sit here and just, you know, be idle you know there's things for me to do to keep me connected to the work that i've been doing for the past few years your team has gone through a lot of turmoil and controversy this football season how has you have you weathered your way through all of that especially because i know that coach gruden was a huge fan of yours he was the one who spotted you on the practice field and said him we want him yeah that was tough um just from you know dealing with the fact that You know, some of the things that he said are unacceptable, but at the same time, you know, like you said, a lot of love and respect for him for just giving me an opportunity and for him, you know, speaking greatness into me when I didn't, when I first got to the team and I was just like, you know, I'm just trying to keep a job and not mess this up, you know, but he was telling me that I was going to be great and stuff. So it was tough. And then, you know, the following week losing Henry and then other guys on the team, getting hurt and then me getting hurt. And then mm. as soon as I get back from being hurt, I get COVID. So, you know, it's just and one thing after another. I mean, that's where like meditation comes in and uh, just having a relationship with my higher power comes in. You know, it's not necessarily about what happens. It's more so like the response to it and my perspective through it all. And just realizing that, you know, all of these things are really just, you know, tests to my faith or tests to, you know, what I, truly believe and it's like you know i can have peace through all that you don't really know if you have peace until you know things really get chaotic so just through the work that i've been doing like i feel like i could be a source of peace for not only guys on the team but the coaching staff 
as well. It's like through all these things, like, yeah, we experience these emotions and we can allow ourselves to feel those emotions and validate them. But at the same time, it's like we can allow ourselves to hurt and grieve and move on. Like we don't have to be like, Oh, I'm good now. Like everything, like, like we can feel those things and still move forward and give the best that we can of our ability. So, you know, just trying to work. How did the team as a whole move through that whole coaching controversy? I mean, did, you know, was it helpful to talk? Were people angry? Were people shocked? I'm sure you, I mean, you said you were shocked, I'm sure, to read those emails. I'm just curious how, meant in a mentally healthy way, you, you yourself and as a teammate and as a team leader helped get everybody through that. I mean, I just try to have conversations with guys and say how I really felt. And then, because I feel like in environments when I say how I really feel, I feel like people are kind of like, oh, wow, this is, I can say how I really feel too. So, you know, just from the conversation I was having with guys, but most guys, I mean, they, they don't want to show vulnerability or how they really feel because they feel like it's a sign. It's like a sign of weakness. And then like any sign of weakness that's shown, you know, could be taken advantage of by another player or the front office people upstairs when they're keeping the roster together. So it's like a lot of guys just like, you know, don't want to share. Mm -hmm. So there's that, but I mean, I just try to do what I can from person to person and have a open conversation with individuals and, and if it's in a group setting, so just trying to do it from there. Did you ever talk to coach yourself? Um, we've, we've texted through the season and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I haven't really had a conversation with him. I did, he's just, you know, he's just not a guy that's trying to show, he's like one of those guys that's not really trying to show that emotion and you can't really pull it out of him. You know, you have to allow them to learn and come to that place of wanting to be vulnerable for themselves because that's what I had to do. Right. That's how you recover and get better. Finally, I just wanted to, and this is nothing to do with recovery, but I'm just curious what you make as, as a very successful player in the NFL of the whole Brian Flores situation and his suit against the NFL and his, you know, and a lot of people feel that in a, in a league where 70% of the players are black, you know, why aren't there more black head coaches and why isn't the Rooney rule working? And, you know, what's, how do you feel about that? Um, I mean, I feel like he definitely has a legit argument, um, because, you know, black coaches aren't really given those opportunities that they are. I mean, like Steve Wilkes, they're getting them out of there in one year. They're getting them, like David Culley, they're getting them out of there in one year. And the, the leash is shorter. And it's like, you look at it and it's like, why is that? You know, right? we have these inspired change in the end zone. And we talk about the league diversity is at the core of the league, but you know, it kind of seems like, some of the same thinking patterns um, are still being passed down from, you know, hundreds of years ago. Like we've had things have changed. There have been freedoms that have been granted to us, but it's almost in a way it's like a, you know, we want to help you succeed, but we don't want you to succeed that much. That's what it's like to me. Um, yeah. And, you know, I wish it was different and that it, that it could be different. Mm -hmm. uh, and hopefully we take the steps to have an honest evaluation of self and, you know, from the higher ups in the league and the people that are cutting the checks to different teams, you know, it's like, hopefully those people can get to a place where it's like, hmm, maybe there is some bias here. Maybe there is some, you know, residue of not wanting them to be in charge or that they should be subordinates. It's like, why don't we just get real about it and have those conversations? Because if we, we can't go anywhere unless we know where we're at right now. And so hopefully those conversations happen instead of just trying to preserve self-image. I don't know how anybody can argue that there isn't bias in the NFL. I mean, there are fewer black coaches now than there were when the Rooney rule was implemented in 2003. Right. You know, the text message that Brian Flores got that was mistakenly sent to him clearly shows the job interview with the Giants was a sham. I'm not even sure why he got fired from the Miami Dolphins. Didn't he turn that team around? Yeah, he turned, he definitely, uh, turned the team around. Um, I mean, historically, I mean, I don't know what goes on in that building. So, uh, yeah, who knows? Like it, it does, it just doesn't make sense when you look at it. It doesn't make sense. So what, I mean, obviously the Rooney rule isn't working. Something else needs to change, doesn't it? Uh, yeah. I mean, it looks like that. It's kind of like 
this is like a bomb of checking off a box, honestly, instead of realizing that, you know, kind of like I was telling you, like when I got on the call, I was meeting with my coaches. It's like forming that relationship. And, you know, I feel like, you know, there's a lot of coaches out there that get these jobs that are worried about themselves and like boosting themselves up and their egos. And just like, I'm getting this position and I'm going to make these things happen, you know? And it's really, it's like forming relationships with players and in a league with a lot of black players. Yeah. You know, young black men form relationships with, you know, black men and these black coaches that have fought for their way to get through. So they're going to value their position. They're going to value those relationships. So I don't know, but yeah, more work needs to be done. Clearly. Well, Darren Waller, congratulations. Um, my gosh, what a, what a story you have. Um, Phoenix like rising from the ashes of a near fatal overdose to being a star player of the NFL out there every day on the field. Um, you're a real inspiration. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed this. Thank you so much for listening today to Heart of the Matter. You can find this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and on our website at drugfree.org slash podcast. And as a reminder, if you need help with a loved one who is struggling with substance use, you can text 55753 or visit drugfree.org. We'll talk to you soon.